means that the number one pick in the 2021 NBA draft goes to the Detroit Pistons. Who's got the number one pick in this year's Detroit. draft? Who's got the number one pick in this year's draft? Basketball! Select Isaiah Stewart. The Detroit Pistons select Killian Hayes. Sadiq, that was absolutely sensational. I don't know what went into that process. I met the criteria to be selected, but I wasn't. From long range. Oh! Yes! Yes! Detroit Basketball! Pistons fans, welcome back to another edition of the Palace Pistons podcast, part of the Believe Podcast Network. I'm your host, Mike Angolano, and joining me, as always, is Jasper Apollonia holding down the fort without Aaron Johnson here. Aaron is unfortunately sick and can't talk, uh, which does not make for very good podcast banter. Jasper, how are you doing? Yeah, he's got a, a voice for uh, telegrams. Um, <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, it's great to be here. So happy to have you back holding down the fort with me. Uh, happy birthday to you as well, Mike. You and I are the, the grizzled veterans of Palace of Pistons. And by that, I mean we're in our late 20s. Um, <laughs> Which yeah. is like eight years older than uh, Dylan. That's right. I'm, I'm <laughs> pretty sure I'm pretty sure Czar just, uh, I don't know, turned what, like 13 or something? You, so. you might be a decade older than him. That's God, that's actually probably true. Okay. Well, I didn't want to get depressed starting off in our first minute of recording, but yet here we are. Um, yeah, man. This is a Pistons to... podcast. That's true. That's true. <laughs> but today we actually have a little something to be to be happy about. The Pistons doubled their win total on the season last night, uh, beat the, the Houston Rockets. Kate Cunningham, Jalen Green faced off. That was a fun game, man. Uh, both guys looked really good. And to be honest, at the end of the day, and as a Cavs fan, I'm sure you would agree in this case with, with the selection of Evan Mobley as well. I think both fan bases are probably pretty happy with the guy they got, right? Yeah, I think the top three picks, and this is a pretty deep draft and maybe a good discussion for another podcast in the middle of the say, season. And so Scotty far, Barnes. Scotty Barnes, good. Davion Mitchell good we all poo-pooed that pick but yeah. Davion Mitchell is a good player you know so mm -hmm. is uh Suggs um, Suggs still like you can yeah. see the flashes for Suggs especially as a yeah. playmaker but yeah man I mean I, as a Pistons fan last night was great K did all the things I wanted him to do he shot the ball effectively took advantage of mismatches um and when Jalen Green threw down that absurd dunk which was you have to give the guy all the credit in the world that was a great take yep. smoked Kate off dribble took it up and just got, got in his face and like I think if you're a Houston's man you love the passion from Jalen Green and if you're a Pistons fan you love the just stone face from Cade Cunningham coming back down the floor sitting on the bench that guy is just unflappable yeah I mean, dude, he is 20 going on 200. He is <laughs> wise. Like, he is so mature beyond his years. And you can just really see it. He is such a solidifying presence for that team. They really do play different when he is on the floor. I don't know what it is. I mean, obviously, his passing is great. His ability to play the game at his own pace is great. But, like, there's something just when he's on the floor, they play better, period. And, you know, everything I think we were saying before the draft about Kate Cunningham and why you want to take him number one overall, I think that was just put on display last night. 100% that that calmness under pressure. Uh, Mike, I know you unfortunately missed the fourth quarter. Uh, Kate Cunningham came through in the biggest plays of the game. The biggest play of the game was Cade hitting a three and then coming back down the court and taking a charge on Jalen Green. It that was where the Pistons won the game. Yes, there was three minutes left, but you could feel the Houston crowd getting into it. They were ready to erupt. And Cade Cunningham just completely took all the air out of the building. And like, that's why you take that guy number one overall. 
Yeah, he, you know, it, he's playing well and he had no preseason essentially. So we could treat the first, you know, his first five games as a preseason. And you could see that in the beginning, his shot looked a little bit flat. I think you noted it on Twitter. Everything just looked flat. He didn't have his feet underneath him. He was eight for 18 last night. He had 20 points. He was 50% from three. Overall, he looked, he's, you know, he certainly looked the part of first overall pick in the draft and linchpin to whatever team the Pistons are taking to the playoffs. Yeah. Certainly looked like that guy. And you know what, Mike, you're totally right when you say he didn't have a preseason. He's basically finishing up his preseason right now. And you can even see it in his shooting splits. They've literally, they've gone up every single game. He's only shooting 28% from the floor, 22% from two, which is bad. But when you look at his first three games versus these last two, the first three games, he is, and this is like really gross, one of 21 from three. Over his last two games, seven of 15. So like in his first three games, he shot 12%, 14%, 23% from the floor, respectively. Last night, 44% from the floor. The game before that, 53% from the floor. So you're literally seeing the improvement on a game-by-game basis with Cade right now. Right. Right. And he will continue to get better. And the rotation right now, I don't think it's obviously solidified. I mean, I, you know, Hamadou Diallo did not play yesterday. Um, and his cast of characters around him is going to change probably throughout the year due to injury and effectiveness, things like that. But, you know, he has the ability to impact every single area of the game. He had four boards. He had three dimes. He had two steals. He had a block. You know, he's going to turn the ball over. That's what point guards do. That's what guys with high usage do, <laughs> especially when they're young, is they're going to turn the ball over. That's that's just something that the Pistons are going to have to live through. But yeah, he, he looked good. Um, that's a, that's a positive win. I know that that game was a nationally televised game. Uh, uh, maybe the general fan was not too excited to see t- at the time, two teams with a combined two wins face off, but you know, that there are some electric players out there and Jalen green, you know, like we had alluded to earlier, if, if you picked one of those top three guys, you're a happy camper. I think that Jalen Green is going to be totally fine. He levitates on his jumpers. Oh, yeah. He's very electric. He's not a very good shooter, but he is going to shoot. He's got a Dion Waiters mentality of shooting, and I'd <laughs> rather go 0 for 40, but he, you know, he kept his confidence going to shoot those last 30 shots or whatever. So um, fun game yesterday. No, I, I did not get to see the fourth quarter, unfortunately, but from what I did see, um, a very fun game and it packs up the Pistons second win of the season. And that is actually, no, I, the Pistons were not favored. My apology. They've only been favored once this year. And that was a six point, um, line against the Orlando magic. So they've been underdogs in every game, but one. This year, uh, probably not willing to bet on the Pistons. Although last year they were excellent at covering. They were very, very good at covering the spread. Um, but I don't know if I would bet on them. But what I would do is head on over to bet online. If I were to bet on a team that's not the Pistons. There's that segue, bet. folks. That's why we needed Mike back. Look at, <laughs> listen to that segue. Oh my God. I've had a lot of practice. Um, head on over to the new updated desktop or mobile website. And sign up today. That's Bet Online. Sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on the first deposit and use the promo code BELIEVE50. That's B L E A V 50 to receive your bonus. Believe and Bet Online. Back better than ever. A new web interface for the start of the basketball season and more props, odds, and lines than ever before. And Bet Online remains your number one spot for all the basketball and football action this season from basketball, football, baseball, postseason. Well, that just ended. Uh, NHL, boxing, <laughs> UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 
season in 2022 is rapidly approaching. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet all your favorite sports. Again, sign up today, receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Use the promo code believe 50 that's B L E A V five zero to receive your bonus Bet online where the game starts. You know, we had talked about this a little bit before the pod, but there is a fight happening and it's so ridiculous and out of nowhere that we have to talk about it, at least for a little bit. Uh, it's Darren Williams fighting Frank Gore. Yes, point guard Darren Williams against ageless running back wonder Frank Gore. Um, I, I kind of love that. It's uh, the guy <laughs> who never got old versus the guy who was washed by the time he was like 29. I kind of love that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> going to the Brooklyn Nets with all those guys at that time was like uh, – what, what the Lakers are thought of now is just all the old men everywhere. Um, uh, Frank who, who had the 200. Who, who had, I'm sorry, wait. Who had the no, funnier no, cover, uh, Sports Illustrated cover in hindsight? That uh, Brooklyn Nets super team from 2013 or the, uh, or the, the 2000 and what, what was it? 2012 Los Angeles Lakers with Kobe and Steve Nash and Dwight Howard. I'm trying I think to think the Lakers one is funnier just yeah, because th- that was just a circus. It's true. The Nets I think everyone kind of knew. Yeah. I think everyone kind of knew that when the Nets got Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett and Jason Terry, I think everyone kind of thought, what the heck? Those guys were already old when they were in Boston. And then you send them to Brooklyn and what did we expect one year later with a different squad around them? The Lakers won. They got Nash and Dwight Howard. I think a lot of people thought the Dwight Howard move was a good move at the time. And then, you know, he fell off a cliff. I think that one's funnier because of just how horrible it turned out between Steve Nash getting hurt almost immediately and Dwight Howard being so ineffective. And just hated. Kobe and Bryant just hated. hated him so yeah. much. Yeah. Um, Yeah. yeah, Let me say this. I cannot in. So this is the weird thing. You were telling me right before we we started recording. Frank Gore is plus 200. He's the underdog in this fight. Yes. Those odds give Darren Williams a 71% chance to emerge as the winner. I mean, I mean, Darren Williams is younger, right? I'm assuming he probably has a slight height and reach. Six inches taller. Wow, really? I mean, Darren, Darren yeah, Williams I mean, is 6'3", Frank six, Gore is 5'9". Is he really only 5'9"? That's crazy. Yep. Okay, so they're probably giving it to him on the reach advantage, right? They have to. Probably. I mean, but they got away, like, the same. It, it, Frank Gore probably, yeah, they probably got away the same at, like, most. I feel like Frank Gore probably still weighs more than he does. And, like, I don't know, man. Probably. After, after seeing Nate Robinson get knocked out by a Paul <laughs> brother... Uh, I don't think I can in good conscience take any NBA point guard, former or current, to 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 beat a guy who's just bigger and stronger than him. You know what I mean? Uh, like Frank like, Gore ran head first into linebackers for a living and did it and could probably still do it. I was surprised yeah. that after Derrick Henry went down that the Tennessee Titans didn't sign Frank Gore. Yeah, why not? Why what, not? Yeah, I'd shoot. Might as well if you're going to take Adrian Peterson back. Right. Um, yeah, no, I, for me, look, the thing about boxing is that, like, boxing is the great equalizer. If you're a smaller guy and you know how to box, you can beat up a bigger guy who doesn't know how to box. Uh, here's the thing, though. Uh, neither of these guys are boxers. So, <laughs> for me, I That's can't really be. funny. Right? Like, I can't, I can't be like, well, you know. Uh, Darren Williams has the height advantage, but Frank Gore's technique and footwork is just so I like, I, who knows, man, I'm going to take the guy who I think is tougher and stronger. And um, maybe that's just my, my bias speaking, but I think it's probably the, the former running back and not the former point guard who, who fits that criteria. So that's, that's, those are my thoughts on, on this marquee matchup. Right. Well, it is the it is the precursor to Jake Paul versus Tommy Fury, which mm. I'll be honest, I'm not I'm not going to watch this fight. Mo- most likely it is December 18th, but 
I thought, figure we have to talk about a little bit since it does have an MVP point guard. Um, after Steph Curry dropped a 50 point game, I don't think it was yesterday, I think it was the day before, his MVP odds are now the highest on Bet Online. Curry's plus 200. I don't um, hate that. They haven't even gotten Clay back yet, and they're the number one team in the West. So they are. What does that tell they you? They are very good. So and their defense, it's their defense that's carrying them. Steph's not even like playing that well, which is the crazy thing. Obviously, 50 point game aside, which, by the way, I don't know if you were listening to the opposing team broadcast. I, for some reason, I can't remember who they were playing against, but the, uh, the opposing team's announcer. I've never heard an announcer hate so hard in my life. Steph gets 50. The Golden State crowd starts cheering for him. The mm-hmm. other announcer goes, you know, Steph won a unanimous MVP. Is this really a big deal? 50 points? Do people really <laughs> care about this? I'm like, are you joking? <laughs> it's, no. it's a 50-point game. Yes. Yes, people care. It's that still exciting. It's greatness. I mean, come Speaks on. Speaks to his greatness. That's why when LeBron has a, a triple double, it's not headline on ESPN. It's like, oh, he had a triple double. Or if Ugh. Russell Westbrook, I mean, he had a triple double last night. Well, and yes, actually but really helped the, the Lakers win. He, those he Russell hit some Westbrook, big shots. Those Russell Westbrook uh, triple doubles don't quite hit like they used to. They don't, uh, but that, so. that, that's, well, when you shoot four for 15, it <laughs> exactly. certainly does damper a little bit. But that just speaks to the greatness that it's a 50 point game. Mo Williams has a 50 point game and it was on ESPN, you know, running along the ticker for like three days. Yeah. Uh, this is, this Steph is how Curry you know. It, and we're like, really again, <laughs> this is, this is how, you know, Mike is a Cavs fan where he goes, ah, Mo Williams. That's the he, first 50 point game I can think of. Actually, he did that with Minnesota. Shockingly. Oh. Enough, I, I believe he was on the Timberwolves. All that. right. Well, I stand corrected. I know Corey Brewer had a 50, 50 point game for the Minnesota. I think Derek Rose did too. Didn't he? Yeah, he did. He certainly well, did. What is with the Timberwolves having 50 wow. point, 50 point games or players to, 50 point games and it leads to leads to nothing well um, mike we could we could stand here and sporacle all day but we could and i do and i do love doing that don't we all? um yeah uh so step curry plus 200 that's a head of Giannis, kd luca donovan mitchell is somehow plus 1400 and then joel and beats plus 1600 so just kind of interesting but of course head on over to bet online you'll see these and uh plenty more bets and prop bets uh, to go ahead and dig into. And again, use our promo code believe 50 and get your 50% welcome bonus for your first deposit. So we didn't really have a set schedule of stuff that we wanted to hit on, but I did want to look at the last 10 games. The Pistons are two and eight. They've now gone through 10 games. Like we said earlier, they've only been favored in one of those games and they did win. Um, I have pulled up their offensive and defensive advanced metrics through, through those games. Hmm. And we had mentioned earlier <clears throat> prior to the season starting that they have a pretty tough start to the season. You figure four of their first six, seven. I mean, they're playing, they've played a playoff team every single night out except for two so far. That was Orlando and Houston. They've played a playoff team from last year or a drastically improved team in eight out of those 10 games. They played the Bulls twice. They played Atlanta. They played Philly twice. They played Brooklyn twice. They played Milwaukee. So they're getting the heavy hitters and they're two and eight. Mm. Any general things that you've seen from the offense? Let's start with the offense. The off- because that's the, that's the, the saddest part uh, yeah, to so talk that's... about. What have you seen or not seen out of this offense? And I've got some stats that I'll mention after you're well, done well i mean first off mike i mean it, it's bad uh that doesn't that doesn't surprise anyone i mean they are the worst offense in the league by still a, a considerable margin i believe um and really the number one thing for this offense right now is like they cannot hit open shots to save their lives uh, last night alone i counted five five potential assists for Killian Hayes that were wide open shots, wide open that clang off the iron didn't even come close. 
And it's really an issue for this offense right now because you have two guys in, in Kate Cunningham and in Killian Hayes who can create shots and opportunities for others. And they're just not being capitalized on whatsoever. And that's especially when you're looking at like a young player like Killian Hayes, that's really frustrating because he's actually shooting really well from three. He's, his catch and shoot threes are going down for him right now. I believe he's still leading the, the team in three point percentage. So um, yeah, they, they cannot hit open shots and you know, we've been talking about this on the, on the podcast for a couple weeks now, Mike, we've been saying, you know, this is small sample size, small sample size, but at a certain point after 10 games, you do have to wonder, is this just what this team is? Like, no, I don't think Kate Cunningham and Sadiq Bay are going to shoot under 30% from three throughout the entire season. But I do think after this kind of stretch where you're creating so many good looks for so many players over a 10 game stretch and nobody is able to hit them consistently. I think you have to wonder if you need to do something a little different on offense. If you need to just start running some different looks and changing up your offensive philosophy a little bit, because right now it's just not working. And Dwayne Casey has, has actually talked about stuff like this. Like last night on the broadcast uh, at the second quarter, they interviewed Dwayne Casey and he said, you know, this is not going to hold for the entire season. We, this is the sample size. This is not who we are as a team. I'm not sure that's the case. Now I could totally be proven wrong in the next few games because things do get a little easier uh, for the, in terms of the schedule before, of course, you know, the Pistons get smacked again with another six game road streak. But right now, at least offensively, they have a couple guys who can create plays. The problem is they don't have anyone that can, that can really, you know, uh, deliver on the shots that they're being given. The only guy that is delivering on those shots really is one of the guys who's creating them in Killian Hayes. Uh, Jeremy Grant last night was fantastic. Uh, 35 points. Um, I mean, he just could not miss in the first, in the third quarter. He had 21 points from the floor, but, you know, he really carried them and they can't depend on those kind of performances from, from Jeremy Grant every game. So right now on that end of the floor, it's really ugly and they need, they need more period. They just, they need to start hitting some of these open shots. Mike, I'm interested to hear what you have to think. You have to say. I know you have a lot of these synergy numbers up in front of you. Um, I mean, I can't imagine there's any of them that look good because, as of right now, the starting unit with Isaiah Stewart can't shoot, and the backups, which can shoot, can't rebound or defend the rim. So it's like, man, you are stuck in between a rock and a hard place, kind of no matter what you do with these rotations. And I do feel bad for Dwayne Casey in that sense. Yeah. I mean, the numbers aren't, I mean, they're not good. <laughs> they're not good um, at all. I mean, they're less, offensively. They, they're last in every single shooting category. They are um, last in points uh, per hundred possessions. They're last in effective field goal. Um, percentage as well and you know i i like to look at the game logs to look at any trends and they did i mean they were much better yesterday at 110 points per 100 possessions that's that was the 57th percentile they have i mean they they have as many games over 100 points per 100 possessions as they do games less than 90 less than 91. I mean, their first two games, their points per possession was 80. And that was very early, but their, their offense is just, and you could see it. I mean, I remember watching their second game against the Bulls, watching that like, oh, good grief. I mean, there was a period of like six, six to seven minutes in the second quarter where it really, I, I watched them. I watched Killian Hayes bring the ball up the floor. And I can distinctly recall thinking, 
there is no way this is going to end in a bucket. And it, it didn't. And it happened again and again and again. I mean, the offense just seems stuck. And I don't know if it's the distinct lack of shooting. I don't know if it's they're going to need Jeremy Grant to erupt to be in any, you know, in any of these games. Like you said, he had 35 yesterday. He was he was awesome. I don't know what they're going to need. And I don't know if it's just a matter of letting Cade start to get a feel again. But they need something. And I, Aaron has alluded to this before. A rim running big would would have helped. Isaiah Stewart did not look particularly good. I mean, what, he only had like 16 minutes yesterday? Well, he got in. I mean, we can – I mean, I'm not going to harp on this all day, but the refereeing last night was criminal. For a nationally televised game to be refed in that manner for both yeah. sides was – I mean, I, some of these calls were just horrible, horrible. Although I will say, I did like that the mics on court were really like way too hot and Christian Wood was talking so loud the entire game so you could hear him complain about every call that didn't yeah. go his way. I did enjoy that. There was one where he got followed like sometime for the four- – fourth quarter you just hear go oh my god <laughs> it's like <laughs> i did love that <laughs> anyway <laughs> but you know it's very clear that they are they are missing several key components to keep the offense humming they are missing a shooter and i think we were all hoping sadiq bay would be that shooter and you know he has evolved his game a little bit to be a little a little less dependent on other people creating for him which is nice to see but you know not particularly strong in the post. You'd think that he would be a little bit better with, with his size and veteran stature as he was a little bit older coming out of the draft. They, so they need a shooter. They really need a big, I mean, you have said this before, Isaiah Stewart maybe is not the future. You were very early on in that sentiment. They need a good rim running big, like a Christian would perhaps would be, would, would be nice to have. Um, They need Cade to start to, uh, you know, I guess the right word is just to feel more comfortable, but he's, he's already getting there. You're I'm sure you guys have. Yeah. Oh, you are absolutely seeing it. Game Last to game, night you, you saw improving. it. Yep. Because yeah. the thing is when Jeremy Grant in the fourth quarter couldn't hit a shot to save his life, Kate Cunningham came in and just calmed him down. And, and like I said, at the top, he was the guy who, when Houston started making their push and got it within three points, Cade Cunningham is the guy that cut off that run and then drew the charge. And like, that's why he is going to be your best player. Like you, you love Jeremy Grant and what he's doing for you right now, but like you can see it by the end of this season, Cade Cunningham should and will be the main leader on this team offensively. I'm certain of it because teams, I mean, he's already, you saw last night, like he's hitting those threes teams are going to have to start closing out on him way more aggressively. And once they do that, then it's going to open up the rest of his game on the interior. And again, you saw that last night where like he had some really nifty, he has this in and out dribble that he will take, especially when he's pushing the ball up the floor and he has somebody right in front of him. He will kill guys with that. And, and, you know, like we've talked about it, he's not the most explosive athlete. He doesn't have the quickest first step but his skill level is so high in the, in the same way that like, and this was the comparison coming out of, out of college in the way that like Luka Doncic is where he's not the most explosive athlete, but it doesn't matter because he's athletic enough for a six, six guy who's absurdly skilled. Um, So yeah, I mean, uh, overall though, the, the problem is you have a starter in Isaiah Stewart who you need out there for defensive purposes because he's he's the only center you have on your roster that can rebound consistently and challenge shots at the rim. Like I I have been critical of him, but I have to say, like, there's a reason that the Pistons defense is doing okay despite being one of the worst perimeter defenses in the entire league. And the reason is because they contest so many shots near the rim and allow such a low field goal percentage near the rim. And that is all Isaiah Stewart. It's all Isaiah Stewart. I mean, a little bit of Jeremy Grant on that help defense, but it's Isaiah. 
Um, and when he comes out of the game, you have Kelly Olenek in there who opens up the offense because he can shoot and score, but he can't rebound and he can't defend to save his life, which is one of the issues that we brought up when they spent that money on him and got rid of Mason Plumley. Yes, you can understand why they did it, but like last night was one of those nights where you look and you go, man, I... I sure would like to have Mason Plumley on my team. And I feel dirty just saying those words, but you know, there's a time where if Isaiah Stewart gets into foul trouble defensively, they are in huge, huge trouble. They, they don't have answers. Christian Wood had his way with the roster. He, they couldn't do anything to stop him. Right. Right. So in looking at the lineup data and the Pistons have had to evolve their lineups quite a bit because of injuries and, you know, and whatnot, and just a lack of personnel uh, in terms of bigs there, they have one lineup that has played over hundred possessions and it's Killian Hayes, Kate Cunningham, Sadiq Bay, Jeremy Grant, Isaiah Stewart. They play 130 possessions. They're a plus 2.3 in the point differential. I'll take, they it. are exactly 100 per hundred possessions, hundred points per hundred possessions not particularly good they're not a very good shooting lineup they turn the ball over quite a bit but that's a byproduct of two very young primary ball handlers they are the that lineup is the best in terms of offensive rebounds best in the league they're in the 100th percentile Wait, in offensive rebounds 37 Wait, what <laughs> They are, yeah, the 100th <laughs> okay. percentile in terms of offensive boards. 37.6% of the time, they get an offensive rebound, which is also a byproduct of them missing a ton of shots because mm. they have plenty of opportunities. So some good, some bad. They don't get to the line that much, which is a little bit interesting. I, I think you really do want Cade and Killian to be more aggressive. Uh, you definitely want... Killing Hayes too. Defensively, however, this lineup awfully fun. Awfully fun. Yeah. They are only allowing opponents to shoot forty-eight percent. They are allowing ninety-seven point seven points per hundred possessions. That's in the seventy-second percentile. Pretty good. They force a turnover fifteen percent of the time. Pretty good. They are fouling a little bit too much, but that they, you know, I mean, they're young. So defensively, that starting lineup, which I think is the lineup that most of us predicted would be the, the main lineup throughout the year. Offensively, some work to do. 43% you know, effective field goal range, not good. 100 points per 100 possessions is not good. Um, but and, defensively, looks good. And Mike, you can like even see it, and this is the thing we've been talking about, and this is why you need to draft somebody like Paolo Banchero next year. You need that rim running big. Uh, you saw it last night with Cade. He had two turnovers that should not have been turnovers. And the reason that they were turnovers is because he tried to throw a lob to Kelly Olenek. And Kelly Olenek, uh, rim running big and Kelly Olenek have never been used in the same sentence unless there's a is not in the middle of that <laughs> sentence. Um, yeah. Like, so there was two, two turnovers where that, that happened where it was just like, oh, man. You just can see it like Cade needs that. And that's why that lineup is turning over the ball so much. And, and the same thing goes with like Isaiah Stewart, where it's like, you know, defensively you get why it's good. Uh, Cade and Killian on the perimeter are long rangy. They give you a lot of effort. And even more importantly, I think they have fantastic feel for the space and where the passing lanes are. You see so many steals from Killian Hayes where it's like the ball goes right to his hands. You go, oh, he's just, you know, oh, they, that's a bad pass. It's like, no, it's actually not. It's the right pass, except Killian Hayes knew that that was the pass that was going to happen. So he got right in the passing lane before the offense even knew that they were going to have to do that. You love that kind of feel from him. And the other thing I think Killian does really well is he pushes the ball in transition, even better than Cade does. Like, I do like how Cade gets the ball up the floor, but... Killian is really the guy where if he's catching the ball off of a rebound or 
and, and somebody is streaking down the floor, he's going to find that outlet. Um, and when you have Isaiah Stewart behind you, who's going to contest everything at the rim, you understand why that lineup works defensively, 100%. And then, of course, like you're saying, on offense, though, because they don't have that real lob threat, it makes it an issue. And I think one of the things, if, if I were doing Casey, I would consider doing is maybe putting Jeremy Grant into those pick and rolls a little more often and just seeing if he can provide some of that lift offensively. Because, look, right now, a lot of what he's doing offensively, you know, 30% of, of Jeremy Grant's shots are coming from within 4 to 16 feet of the rim. And a lot of those are those little fadeaways that he shoots, which just I hate. I can't stand them. He doesn't shoot well on those shots. I would like to, and, and last night you saw when he was successful offensively, especially in that third quarter, so much of that came because he was aggressive in taking it to the hole. It all got kickstarted on his last possession of the first half when he just took the ball to the rack and threw down that nasty one-handed slam. Like you could just see that got him going. And in the third quarter, he was aggressive offensively, which then opened up his three-point shooting. And it's like, that's just more of what you need from him. So, you know, if I were Dwayne Casey, I would consider maybe switching those roles for Jeremy Grant and Isaiah Stewart. Not all the time, but a little bit offensively. And I think in that case, you know, you can open up a little bit of that pick and pop game, maybe, with Grant, or with Grant and Kate Cunningham. You can change up the pick and roll looks. Um, Grant is an actual lob threat, unlike Isaiah Stewart. And you also can provide an opportunity for Isaiah Stewart to work on his three-point shooting because you want that and you need that from him. So, you know, I think that's like a small little change that they could do. Just run four or five pick and rolls every game. Not even four or five. That's a lot. Run three or four pick and rolls with Jeremy Grant and. Kate Cunningham or Killian Hayes per game. Just see what happens. And, and put Isaiah in the Stewart. Isaiah in the Stewart. Isaiah Stewart in the corner for a couple of possessions. Just see what happens. Work with it. Because right now, offensively, you don't have the answers with that starting lineup. And defensively, with the second unit, it's just not working. And, you know, Trey Lyles has been horrible. Corey Joseph has been really bad as well. I, I think I'm not alone in saying... Let's let's give Saban Lee a shot at that backup point guard position because right now that second unit is just like ugh, it's like a slog to watch him you know, and Trey it's, Lyles it's, like ugh. It, it's funny that you mentioned the second unit because the lineup with the second most possessions well I guess the, I guess the lineup with the third most would be more accurate but the the number two lineup is just swapping out. Frank Jackson for Kate Cunningham, and that had 77 possessions. And that lineup is minus 19.4 on the floor. And so it's drastically different. But the backup lineup, so to speak, of Corey Joseph, Sadiq Bey, Jeremy Grant, um, Kelly Olinick, and uh, Josh Jackson at the four is mm. also a minus 12.3 when on the floor. Um, so the backups. Yeah, and you don't want to know what um, Josh Jackson with the starters looks like. Uh, it's not pretty. So, the, and, and this is all very early and mostly incomplete data because we only have one possession of over, or I'm sorry, one lineup of over 100 possessions. So mm. lots of room to grow. And I, I do think the offense will eventually start to come around a little bit more. I'm hopeful. I mean, it has uh, to, right? I mean, it really can't get too right? much worse. Right, it can't Mike? Get too much right? Worse. No, I don't think you can uh, shoot. I'm gonna go with. Red, I don't think yeah. you can have a true shooting percentage <laughs> under fifty percent for an entire NBA season in 2021. I know that like the, they don't call the fouls that they used to, but like, it does change uh, things. But the defense does look much more promising, and that's what you get with Hayes and Cunningham being the size that they are. That's what you get. Um, with the active hands that they have, you get a pretty high turnover percentage on the defensive end. And that's just, that's just a very nice byproduct to see what you'd like to see though. I think is maybe 
some of that turning into more offense because their transition offense is quite good um, once they get out and run, and that's the youthfulness there. But only 12% are turning into transition opportunities. It's just not a whole lot yet. Off steals, not as much. Off live rebounds, it's a little bit better. But, I, you know, I, I kind of like the idea of putting Jeremy Grant in some of those pick and roll opportunities as well from an offensive side of things just has a little bit more athleticism and seems to be ready for it more. Um, what I don't want to see is the Pistons having to rely on Jeremy Grant going for 28 or more points to stay in a game. I mean, he had to erupt yesterday and the Pistons were just kind of hanging around um, and they only won by eight. So there is quite a bit more that the Pistons have to work with on offense. Uh, so hopefully some of these, some of these uh, offensive numbers I'm looking at can slowly start to uh, improve. I, I think if there's one thing that you can take from this, which is, I mean, look, of course, you have to assume the shooting is going to get a little bit better. It's they're not at any point in this season going to be an offensive powerhouse. And you know what? There's a there is a more than likely chance that they are going to finish as a bottom five offensive unit in the NBA this season. Somebody's got it, and they look like that somebody. Um, but I, the thing that you can really, in my opinion, take from this is, you know, that they have to. Um, oh my god, I completely forgot what I was going to say, Mike. This is why you drink your coffee in the morning, folks, and you don't forget that. Um, Hopefully the editor will edit out this unbelievably embarrassing <laughs> brain part for me, whoever that editor well, may how be. About, how about I, I vamp a little bit while you Go think. In looking, you know, because I'm, I'm oh, looking I'll, at the I got usage. It. Okay, Wait, never mind. Sorry, right ahead. I have to. I'm sorry. Otherwise, I'm going to forget it again. The nice thing about this is even as the schedule gets a little bit easier, not much easier, but a little bit. Through these 10 games, I think you can already see what the answers for this team are. In the sense of, like, you can very easily and quickly identify what the issues are and what kind of players need to be brought in in order to fix those issues. So, you know, if you're if you're Troy Weaver and you're looking at this, yes, obviously you're not super thrilled with the return so far, but you can at least look at your roster and say, okay, at the trade deadline, what kind of players do I need to, to be looking at for the draft? What sort of players do I need to be evaluating and, and looking towards drafting for next season. I, I think for me, if I'm going to take one positive from, from the struggles, it's that they're very easily identifiable struggles. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we knew that this was going to be a pretty poor shooting team coming into the season. They don't have any shooters. I mean, I was, I wrote an article about the, uh, about the forwards or the combos and talking about, how Frank Jackson could outdo Hamadou Diallo just because he has a lick of shooting and that could push him over the edge in terms of minutes. That is not a good, you know, that was not a good paragraph. I did not feel good writing that Frank Jackson might force his way into the lineup because he's one of the better shooters on the team. That is not a, that is not a good thing. Um, so, <laughs> and the thing is, he's still not shooting and he's still playing over Hamadou Diallo. So yeah, what does that is, tell you? He is not shooting well at all. What I was just going to, talk about before you remembered what you were going to say was just about the usage rate. You know, I like, I like to look at it. Killian Hayes has a 30% usage rate. And I think that's kind of where he's going to have to sit in terms of having to create offense, whether it's off the dribble or using his playmaking abilities, Jeremy Grant, pretty high usage as well. Kelly Olenek also fairly high usage rate and Killian Hayes, not, not quite as much. And this is where we're going to get into the Killian Hayes problem is if he doesn't have the ball in his hands, you know, if Kate Cunningham does not have the ball in his hands, we know what he's capable of doing. He's got more of that instinct in cutting and is a more capable shooter and a more willing shooter. If Killian Hayes doesn't have the ball in his hands, what is happening? It's, it's the Colin Sexton problem when he was young younger and it still is a problem if he doesn't have the ball in his hands what is he doing 
Well, um, I mean, look, as of right now, he he's shooting decently. He's shoot, you know, he's shooting almost uh, 38% from three. He's their best three-point shooter right now. And it's almost all exclusively coming on catch and shoot looks. So I, I agree with your overall point because those are kind of the only things he's doing off ball right now is catch and shoot threes. But look, at very least, he's providing a level of shooting. And based on his stroke and the way that he's shooting it, I think it's sustainable. Like, it seems as though Dwayne Casey is committed to playing him more off ball and having Kate as more your primary ball handler. Yes, maybe Killian brings the ball up the floor, but then there's a handoff to somebody on offense. Right. Um, and I think as of right now, look, if Killian's going to shoot, catch and shoot threes well, I'm okay with that. Um, the thing that he needs to improve is, like you said, his cutting, his other off ball movement, because right now, other than the catch and shoot, he's not really a threat offensively, um, to be fair, with or without the ball in his hands. Um, although a symptom of, of that, uh, you know, part of that is a symptom of the Pistons just straight up missing wide open shots. He was only right. he's only averaging three assists per game. Um, you know, if they could hit open shots, he'd be closer to six assists per game. It's, right. It's really that bad. And he's not shooting particularly well at the rim. He's not shooting particularly well in the short to mid range. He's thankfully not taking a whole lot of shots in the long mid. We want to take a step back. Mm -hmm. He's just got work to do. And, you know, he should be, the Pistons should be having him watch Steph Curry move off ball and how he's flying through screens like a madman. Because if that catch and shoot three is more sustainable, and we think that is a, you know, something that can stick. That's something that the Pistons should be trying to leverage. If you're going to have Cade Cunningham be the primary ball handler on offense, and you think that Cade or that, and if you feel that Killian Hayes has the chops to be a, you know, an okay catch and shoot uh, three player, you should be watch, you should be having him watch Steph Curry fly around screens. And obviously they're not the same shooter, but you know, it's, it's just a matter of scaring the defense a little bit you know, to yeah. create a little bit of separation and, and, and to start to move defenders around. Because right now, if he's not moving without the ball and he's not getting looks for catching two threes, there needs to be something else that he can do on offense. Well, hey, Mike, the Pistons used to have a guy who ran around screens pretty well. His name was Rip Hamilton. They can't bring him in? Like, show him the ropes a little bit? Yeah. Sound, sounds like somebody that I would have, you know, if I'm trying to develop a, a guy to – run around screens. Rip Hamilton is one of the first three guys I would think of him, you know, Reggie Miller and Steph Curry. Um, sure. So yeah, I think that would be great. I mean, he just needs to, he needs the growth. And again, we've been saying it, we're only 35 games into Killian Hayes' career. Um, and you can see growth in some aspects, but like, Look, the passing is really good. The defense is really good. I, I mean, I think he's oh yeah, a really good defender. I, and you know, it's unfortunate because that stuff doesn't necessarily show up in the box score so much. But like, he is he and Cade, man, this is like why I wanted Cade so bad. You can just see like if Killian Hayes can put it together on offense just a little bit, he and Cade are going to be the just such a pain in the ass defensively. Um, but the fact of the matter is, you can't stay on the floor in the NBA if you're going to shoot 26 percent from from inside the arc. Period. And that is where Killian Hayes. Yeah, the catch and shoot threes are nice, but like he needs to start finishing at the rim. Um, he needs to start getting those floaters to fall. Uh, otherwise, you know. Of course, this season's already basically a wash, so you can afford to keep him out there with a the starting unit, even if he's struggling. But things are going to have to change next season if he can't, you know, start building on that offensive game. It's just – it has to come around. It has yep, to. It has to. And it doesn't have to be a monumental 0-100 to 100 change either. It, it no. can be gradual. They have time it's to do that. It's okay. You can do the Lonzo Ball thing. Like, it's all right. Sometimes it takes a few years for a guy to develop his – his full arsenal. And that's what happened with Lonzo ball. And 
look, I'm hopeful that it can happen with Killian Hayes because they have very similar statistical profiles, uh, very similar body types, very similar play styles as well. So that's my hope, but we will see. We will see. So the Pistons do have the Cavs on Friday at the time of this recording. That would be tomorrow. I do love that. You got the, the one verse number one versus number two overall pick matchup, and then you follow it up with number one versus number three overall. So, yep, Mike. And then you know, they play the Raptors. <laughs> oh yeah, and then they play the Raptors. So we're just going to oh, go right fun. down the line. Okay. And, and then they play the Kings. So wow. you get the Davion Mitchell as well. So we're really um, getting the full the top six experience. You really are. And then they play Indiana and then the, the schedule starts to get quite a bit harder. So these next four games, Cavs, Raptors, Kings, Pacers, that takes us um, through the 17th of November. And then, you know, the schedule hardens up quite a bit. You have Golden State, the Lakers, the Heat, the Bucks, the Clippers, the Lakers, the Blazers, the Suns. And, the, <laughs> and it doesn't get too much Dude, easier just, until I, I, I'm sorry. Like, I, I know we need to wrap this up, Mike, but we do yes. very, very quickly. The NBA, I just think that that is like beyond disrespectful. Somebody to the hates Pistons, for the Pistons. Instance. That's that's not acceptable. Having them play Brooklyn on a back to back in the in week one, um, you know, after playing Philly, you have them play Philly twice. You haven't played Brooklyn twice. You have them after this. They get four games that are somewhat reasonable, and then they have to go on a five game road stretch to to the West Coast after facing uh, the <laughs> Lakers and the heat at home, it's ridiculous. The West it's coast. Absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. I mean, come on. It's, it's, I'm sorry. Like I understand that it's hard to make a schedule, but that to me just shows like it's either laziness incompetence or malicious because there's no way that a, a team like the Pistons should have such, such an absurdly difficult stretch to open the season it just doesn't make any sense it is it it is it is tough and i'm really hopeful that Cade will play tomorrow i I don't see why he wouldn't i just get nervous with ankle injuries and they may just want to rest him or or whatever but i'm really hopeful that they'll play because i'll be at the game and we'll hopefully get to see him and evan mobley go at it so yes uh, we do need to wrap this up this has been a very long podcast um any other thoughts on the first 10 games for the pistons other than of course uh you know, hopefully the offense is able to come around a little bit, but it's going to be a lot of patience, uh, you know, you know, unfortunately it's been ugly. It's going to continue to be ugly, but with Kate improving game by game, look, there's a light around the the, the corner. Uh, That's not an actual saying there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Now that's a saying. Um, And it's, it's (laughs) going to continue to improve. It's going to be a long process. You can already tell that this team is incomplete and they're not going to be complete this season, but there's hope and they're going to finish with another top five pick. And hopefully they're going to be spending it on Paolo Banchero. And next season we can be looking at this team and saying, ah, isn't that nice? They fixed all those problems. So I have, I have hope. I have faith. Um, You just, you're, we're going to have to keep, struggling for a little bit longer <laughs> yep for just a little bit longer and you know hopefully we see some gradual improvement throughout um throughout this very tough set of games that they have coming up here um jasper good podcast i know we miss aaron very very much uh, maybe he'll be able to speak next week um because i'm sure he would have some just seething things to say about trey lyles or steve blake or any of his other favorite stable of characters that i like yeah. to go back to to poke fun at um, but good, as, as, good podcast. As, Aaron loves his veritable who's who of who cares. So, right. And uh, <laughs> yes, I like I like to bring up Steve Blake at least once a month and just see what happens. Um, <laughs> so good podcast. Uh, we'd like to, of course, thank Bet Online for being the sponsor for this podcast. And once again, head on over to Bet Online and use the offer code BLEAV50. That's B L E A V. Five zero to receive a 50% welcome bonus for your first deposit. Jasper, thank you for joining me. For Jasper, my name is Mike Anguilano. Thank you very much for joining us on this edition of the Palace Pistons podcast, part of the Believe Podcast Network. We will see you all next time.